It's been many years since Harry Potter became part of our lives, but we still can't get enough of it in the wizarding world. Wicked. With the crimes of Grindelwald due this year, we decided to take a look back to the world of Harry Potter and find the craziest theories out there about him and his world. Some of them are straight up weird, while others may even break you. Can we panic now? No matter what though, they're definitely magical. Excellent. Before we count them down though, be sure to click on that subscribe button over there to get all the latest updates from Screen Rant every single day. And can you guess the movie based off of these emoji? Stay tuned for the answer. You have your mother's eyes. Snape is actually alive. Let's get really weird right off the bat. Or should we say, wand. <laughs> At the end of the Deathly Hallows, Professor Snape is shockingly killed off on Voldemort's orders, after we all thought he was the key villain after the Dark Lord. But thanks to magic, it was revealed he was actually on the good side all along. So what happened to Snape's body? When Harry used the Resurrection Stone to see his family before his death, it's a little curious that Snape didn't show up for at least a moment. Sure, they were antagonistic towards one another for years, but Snape was always watching Harry's back. This technically makes him more important to Harry than Remus Lupin, who was present when Snape was not. After the Battle of Hogwarts, the dead are lined up in the Great Hall, but Snape, the unsung hero's body, was nowhere to be found. Perhaps many were still too bitter towards the former Dark Arts teacher, but in the books, even the Death Eaters are laid to rest in the hall. Snape is still mysteriously absent. And finally, you'd think the Potions Master would have an antidote for snake venom on his person. He's the Potions Master after all. Surely he knew the antidote. Of course. So it's seemingly quite likely that Snape survived and simply left everyone and lived out the rest of his life all on his own somewhere. King Potter. For those who've read the Harry Potter books, know there's a famous song sung in the fifth book titled Weasley is Our King. In the book, Ron takes on the mantle of Keeper for the Quidditch team, a whole year before he does so in the movies and eventually wins over the school despite the disastrous start to the season. Originally sung as a taunt from Slytherin, the song was appropriated for the Gryffindor team. While Weasley may indeed be the king, there may be an actual king in the Gryffindor common room. While Snape may have been the half-blood prince, Harry Potter may very well be the reincarnation of King Arthur. Arthur. Let us explain. Go on. It's established in the films and books that Merlin, the Arthurian legend, existed for real. Order of Merlin. Third class. Expressions like Merlin's beard are commonplace. He has his own chocolate frog and has an honor named after him, the Order of Merlin. So if Merlin exists, then Arthur must have as well, right? Exactly. And there's a good chance he was related to Harry. Like Arthur, his real parents were killed in his youth and he was brought to someone else in order to be raised, unaware of his true lineage until it was revealed to him, much like Arthur. Also like the legendary king, Harry pulled the sword from the hat, much like how Arthur pulled the sword from the stone. There were once three brothers who were traveling along a lonely winding road at twilight. Death and the Three Brothers In the Deathly Hallows, we're presented with a story of the Three Brothers, straight from the children's book Tales of Beetle the Bard. In the film, we're treated to a pretty awesome animated sequence in which Hermione narrates the story, which features three brothers and their encounter with death. The three brothers include the one who was on a quest for power, one who wanted to bring back their loved ones, and one who just wanted to carry on living without being chased by death. Each one was bestowed a gift for being able to cheat death, and the theory goes that each brother ended up being represented as characters in the story. The oldest brother in procession of the Elder Wand is the oldest brother and a descent of the first brother. The middle brother is Snape, who just wanted to bring Lily Evans back to life. Harry is naturally the youngest, who's bestowed the invisibility cloak early on and is a direct descendant of the youngest brother. So who's death then? Well, only one character has been in procession of the Elder Wand, the Resurrection Stone, and the invisibility cloak at the same time, and that's actually Dumbledore. In the book, it's said that the youngest brother meets death as an old friend, which Harry does in his depiction of King's Cross after being hit by the killing curse for the second time. Makes sense to us. <sighs> Professor Trelawney. He will return tonight. Sorry. Unlucky number 13. This theory is more about breaking your mind because it makes so much sense rather than sounding trippy. But because it's so earth-shattering and cool, we just had to include it on the list because it changes how we read a certain moment in the books. Professor Trelawney is considered to be something of a fraud by many of the students and staff. And while her powers do seem somewhat limited, there's no doubt she does have some powerful abilities when it comes to predicting the future. They just don't work 99% of the time. Aside from the famous prophecy though, she may have made another mind-blowing prediction in Harry's third year and we didn't even know 
know it. At Christmas time, the divination professor refused to sit down at the Christmas table with the staff and students, citing she would round the number up to 13, which would result in the death of the first person to stand up. Dumbledore, the old softy, had already pulled up a chair for her before she refused it. But there's just one thing. There weren't 12 people at the table. There was already 13. Ron had scabbers with him and thus made the number of people at the table 13. The first to die out of all of them? Yep, you guessed it. Dumbledore. Step up, step up, we've got fighting fancies. Those bleed new guard are just in time for school. Puking pastels. George Weasley is in fact ready for a pretty neat crossover? Because thanks to this theory, the Wizarding World may exist within the same universe as the beloved children's film Willy Wonka and the Chocolate Factory. Even more baffling is that George Weasley may just be the wondrous owner. Here's how. The theory goes that George got his hands on a time turner, which we know are still in existence thanks to the cursed child play, and went back in time to reinvent himself. He used the knowledge he gained from opening Weasley's Wizarding Wheezes and applied it to the Chocolate Factory. Fred and George had already mastered the art of body transformation transforming candy, so they took it to the next level. Willy and George both have a thing for the theatrics, and are both redheads. Curiously though, Willy Wonka has a hearing problem in his left ear, the same ear that was injured in Deathly Hollows. It could be that he used one of his extending ears as a prosthetic, but never got his actual hearing back to normal. The reason for Wonka's use of half furniture in the chocolate factory is also tied into the theory. In a sad twist, it's said to be because George, now Willy, still only considers him half a whole without his twin brother. Using magic and some transfigurations, Figured house elves, he reimagined himself and created the next level of treats and showmanship. When I call your name, you will come forth. I shall place the sorting hat on your head, and you will be sorted into your houses. Low enrollment. Back in 2000, author J.K. Rowling straight up told a fan at a Scholastic hosted chat that the current enrollment at Hogwarts is roughly 1,000 students. But simply by stating that number, fans have begun puzzling over details and realized that something doesn't quite add up. If there's roughly 1,000 students in the castle, then a class size should be made up of roughly 35 students per house. Yet it seems that in Harry's year, there's only 10 Gryffindors selected. In the books, we actually see the whole year get sorted, and it doesn't take that long. Aside from our main trio, the house picked up Seamus, Dean, Neville, Lavender, Parvati, and Faye. One theory believes that the usual enrollment is 1,000, but in this particular schooling year suffered a hit thanks to Voldemort killing off many families during his first reign. That in turn created a baby drought and brought the enrollment of Hogwarts down by the time Harry walked through the front gates. Many other families likely didn't want to send their children to Hogwarts due to the horrible events that happened just over a decade past. With a smaller year though, we got to know most of the students across many houses that much more though. So so it's a fair trade-off for the story. Do you think this theory adds up, or that Rowling just made a mistake? Why Neville sucked at magic. Neville Longbottom never had it easy at Hogwarts. When he wasn't forgetting, well, everything, he was often botching spells and being terrorized by Severus Snape. Why is it always me? Neville's poor performances resulted in him calling himself a squib at one point. His parents were said to be great aurors, that's dark wizard catchers, until they went insane. So Neville definitely felt the pressure of living up to his legacy. So why didn't it all work out for him? It could just be that Neville is a bit clumsy, but there's another very subtle hint that suggests that it's not actually Neville's fault he's a poor spellcaster. In both the books and the movies, there's one law that rules supreme. The one chooses the wizard, Mr. Potter. Only Neville didn't have this opportunity as he chose to use his father's wand. Despite wanting to carry on his father's legacy, he began years of botched spellcasting. It wasn't until the battle in the Department of Mysteries where things would change. His father's wand broke in the battle, resulting in Neville needing a new one. Going forward, Neville's power improved significantly and was able to hold his own quite well in the final battle. It's never confirmed that the wand is the reason for any of this, but this subtle detail makes a lot of sense to us. And how does one stretch his soul? You already know the answer to that, Tom. How a Horcrux is made. Horcruxes are a big deal in the Potter stories, being hinted at as far back as the Goblet of Fire novel. They're the method which allowed Voldemort to live on after death and become the threat he was known for. In order to create a Horcrux, one must tear the soul, as we know, and that involves murder. While that's the initial act of Horcrux 101, it doesn't actually explain how they are made, now does it? Well, there's an internet theory for that, and it's pretty messed up, we gotta say. Oh, buddy, I'll have you go. 
JK Rowling has actually been unusually quiet on this matter, making us wonder if the internet is onto something here. We do know that her editor apparently almost threw up when reading the initial pitch, so we may be onto something. While murder is definitely the first step in tearing the soul, the next bit is a bit more gross. The theory suggests that Voldemort has to consume the flesh of his victims in order to finalize the creation of a horcrux. I think I'm gonna be sick. In many ancient cultures, doing this was seen as a way to take in the power and might of a person, so it makes sense that this would be something that Voldemort did to complete the process. That way, the soul of the deceased has nowhere else to return to, solidifying the creation of the Horcrux in the most evil and inhumane way possible. It's an odd sort of place, this, isn't it? <laughs> Do you live here? No. Really? But the reason Lockhart was hired at Hogwarts. We've always wondered just why on earth Gilderoy Lockhart was hired to teach defense against the dark arts in the second year of Harry's tenure. Many of the students, like Ron, were able to see through his ploy after only a few classes and recognize he was in fact a fraud. So if some second year student could do that, surely the headmaster of Hogwarts knew, right? Certainly. Well, according to this theory, he did. Dumbledore full on knew about Lockhart's deception and decided to hire him anyway. Why? Well, as it turns out, Dumbledore was a bit of a prankster and thought it would be funny. He knew a lot of wizards that Lockhart cheated and knew from the outset that the stories he was telling were a fabrication. Rather than expose him in front of everyone, he hired him as a professor at Hogwarts and waited for him to fall apart due to being unable to teach a class properly. Of course, this means that everyone learning Defense Against the Dark Arts that year basically had zero education. So while Dumbledore may have had a laugh, he definitely didn't put the students first. Knowing that the uneven teaching of the class was used in part to get umbrage in the school, School, Dumbledore should be held accountable for that. You're a wizard, Harry. I'm a what? Harry Potter's Imaginary World Perhaps the cruelest of all the fan theories out there, this one suggests that Harry's wondrous world was in fact all a lie. The theory suggests that thanks to Harry's poor living conditions at the Dursleys, including malnourishment and verbal abuse, Harry actually ended up becoming mentally ill. In fact, he's not even the son of Lily and James Potter. He's a Dursley who invented the Potters as an escape from the cruel reality of the cupboard under the stairs. Now I'm really depressed. When Harry imagined putting a pig's tail on Dudley, his actual parents drew the line and sent him to a mental institute for help. It's here that Harry makes up the universe known as Hogwarts, and there are a bunch of clues that tie into the theory. We don't have time to get into them all, but Harry becomes friends with Lupin, who represents lunacy. He wanders a psychological maze with the help of Mad-Eye. He imagines his perfect parents in the mirror and quickly becomes trapped in the fantasy. In the fifth book, as Sirius becomes more stable, the openly insane Bellatrix murders him and plunges Harry back into madness. Harry himself was at risk of going to Azkaban earlier on in that entry, a hospital that is far worse than Hogwarts. If you want to read the entire thesis, be sure to check it out online. That's all for now. Which Potter theory do you think is the most messed up? Which is the wackiest? Of all of them, which one do you think is the most likely to be true? Let us know in the comments below and be sure to like this video and subscribe to the channel to get more awesome videos like this one in your playlist every day. And the answer to our emoji question is... Thanks for watching.